ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اخوت الاسلام يا عباد الله we have an authentic narration that is collected by imam al bukhari in his sahih and likewise by imam muslim in his sahih and it is upon the authority of ibn umar or ridwan allah ta'ala alayh in which the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he stated buni al islam ala al khams shahadati an la ilaha illa allah wa anna muhammad rasulullah wa iqam as salat wa ita az zakat wal hajj wa sawm ramadan the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that islam is built or based upon five and then he mentioned these five things the testimony that there is no deity worthy of worship and truth except allah tabarak wa ta'ala and that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger and to establish the salah and pay the zakah and the pilgrimage and fasting the month of ramadan fasting the month of ramadan ikhwat al-islam ya ibad allah these are the five pillars of islam that are well known to every muslim so much so the youngest from amongst us is aware of it and as a result of it a result of this if anyone is to deny any of these pillars of islam and their obligation then they will be considered to be committing kufr or disbelief in allah tabarak wa ta'ala due to these pillars being ma'lum in ad-din bi durura so well known that even the kufar know the, uh, about these pillars and at the head of the pillars is the two testimonies the first testimony being the me, being the testimony of at-tawhid ashhadu an la ilaha illallah the second testimony is a testimony of mutaba'a yani conformity yani ashhadu anna muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and these two testimonies are the most obligatory thing upon the individual that one starts with this first but they are not merely statements that are uttered with the tongue but the, these two statements have a meaning and it points to something that meaning and what it entails or points to has to be believed in and there has to be a firm determination to enact what they, what what it what they mean and entail 
This is what is most obligatory upon an individual. After an individual accepts this, then there is nothing that is more binding upon him than the second pillar. As-salah, or iqam as-salah, the establishment of the salah. And this is seen in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, in which the Prophet sallallahu when he was sending Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen for da'wah purposes, the Prophet sallallahu he said to him, إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي قَوْمٍ مِنْ أَحْلِ الْكِتَابِ فَلْيَكُونْ أَوَّلْ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ الشَّهَادَةُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمِّرَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهِ إِفْطَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسُ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ He said, indeed you are going to a nation from amongst the people of the book, meaning the Nasara. So let the very first thing you call them to be the testimony of that Tawheed and the testimony of al mutabaa Let that be the first thing you call them to. And if they obey you in that, then inform them that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has made binding upon them five daily prayers. Five daily prayers. This jumla or this sentence is a conditional clause in the Arabic language. That you can't go to the next without fulfilling the first. Showing that there is nothing more obligatory after an individual makes the two testimonies than the salah, than the prayer. And the condition of the prayer is something tremendous in our deen. As is seen in the hadith of Abi Huraira, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا يُحَاسَبُوا بِهِ الْعَبْدِ بِصَلَاتِهِ فَإِنْ صَلَحَتْ فَقَدْ أَنْجَهَا وَأَفْلَحْ وَإِنْ فَسَدَتْ فَقَدْ خَابَ وَخَسِرَ That the very first thing, meaning the very first physical action or ritual act of worship, that the servant will be held accountable for is his salah. So if it is correct, then he is saved and is successful. But if it is corrupted, then he is defeated and has lost. He is defeated and has lost. For this reason, Ya Ibad Allah, it is incumbent upon us as Muslims to be concerned with the salah and the performance of it, making sure that it is done properly in accordance with that which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has legislated. In accordance with that which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala loves and is pleased with. And the salat that is in accordance with the, with the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has legislated and that which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala loves and is pleased with. For this reason the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he stated in the hadith of Abu Sulaiman Malik ibn Huwayrith Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli Pray as you have seen me pray. Pray just like I have, uh, just like you have seen me pray. This is the salat that is correct, that will lead to success, that will lead to an individual being saved. And the salat that contradicts this, that it is a salat that will lead to defeat. It is a salat that is corrupted. It is the salat of the loser. For this reason, it is incumbent upon us to be focused on ensuring that we're praying to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends. As there are, are an abundance of mistakes made as it relates to the Salat in this day and time that people undertake based off ignorance. Based off ignorance. And in light of some of these textual evidence, that was just presented, then we want to take a look at some of the mistakes that are made so that they may be left off. And from the most 
one of the most prevalent mistakes that is, that is made as it relates to the salah is at talafud bin niyyah yani expressing the intent with the tongue Oh Allah, I plan to do, uh, yani, pray such and such salah for you for a raka'ah and thus forth and so on At talafud bin niyyah is incorrect or audibly expressing the intention as there is no doubt that the intent, the niyyah, is a condition for the acceptance of the salah. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated in a hadith that's muttafiqun alayhi. And it is upon the authority of Umar ibn al-Khattab. In which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, إِنَّمَا لَعَمَالْ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مُرِئِمْ مَا نَوَاهِ The all actions are by intention, and every individual will get that which he has intended to the end of the hadith. So there is no doubt that the intent is a condition for the acceptance of the salah. However, as Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ibrahim Ali Shaykh, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he explains what the niyyah is. He says, yani, tasawwuruka. Yani, you conceive in something. Tasawwuruka ma sayyaf'aluhu wal azam alayhi. That it is an individual conceiving to, to do something and having determination in that regard. Thuma yaf'aluhu. Then the individual does it. Thuma yaf'aluhu ba'da tasawwur. He does it after he has conceived or thought about doing that action. Wa hiya min al qalb. And it is in the qalb or the heart. This is the place of the intention, the heart. لا حظ اللسان فيها أبدا والتلفظ بها بدعة And the tongue has no place or portion in the intent. And to audibly express the intent on the tongue is an innovation. It is an innovation. لِأَنَّ هَذَا لَمْ يَسْدُرَ مِنَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَلَا مِنْ خُلَفَائِهِ وَلَا مِنْ صَحْبِهِ الْمُرْضِيِّينَ وَلَا أَحَدَ الْأَئِمَّةِ الْمَتْبُوعِينَ And that is because this type of expressing or uttering the intention, it did not emanate from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Nor did it emanate from his rightly guided successors. Nor did it emanate from anyone from amongst his companions. None from amongst his companions did this. Did this. Nor any of the imams that have followed the four imams or the, the uh, yani ashab al-madhahib. Because we know there are more madhahib than just four in, in Islam. But none of them, none of the imams of these madhahib did this. But this particular mistake, it came about due to one of the students of Imam al-Shafi'i misunderstanding a statement of Imam al-Shafi'i. And as a result, this, this student's un- misunderstanding has been followed throughout the centuries. Even though some of the major students of Imam al-Shafi'i refuted this. Even though some of the major students of Imam, Sh- Imam al-Shafi'i refuted this. So talafud bin niya bid'ah. Yani, audibly expressing the intent, it is an innovation. It was not done during the first generation of Muslims. Likewise, from the mistakes that are made in the salah, is as it, <coughs> is as it relates to the sujood or the prostration, where we find individuals prostrating on the forehead, but not flattening their faces to the ground where their nose is touching the ground as well. As the Prophet wasallam, he stated in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, Umirtu and Ashjuda, Allah sabati a'adhum. I have been commanded to prostrate on seven bones. Al Jubha wa ashara bi yadihi ala al anf. And he stated at the forehead and then he pointed with his finger to his nose. That the forehead and the nose should be touching the ground. One's face should be flat on the ground. وَالْيَدَيْنِ وَالْرُكْبَتَيْنِ 
وَأَطْرَافِ الْقَدَمَيْنِ And the two hands, and the two knees, and the tips of the toes. And the tips of the toes. But unfortunately we find a, 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 an abundance from amongst us prostrating incorrectly. And this is something of great importance. Because the uh, individual is not brought closer to Allah to Ta'ala in any position in the Salah like he is in the Sujood. As the Prophet وسلم, he stated, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ السَّاجِدِ فَأَكْثِرُوا الدُّعَى The closest that a servant is to his Lord is when he is prostrating. So supplicate abundantly in your prostration. Supplicate abundantly in the prostration. And Imam al-Shawkani, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he states, as sujood ghayyat uh, al that the sujood, it is the essence of humility or being humbled. Wa tarqul takabbur, wa kasrul nafs, and the abandonment of arrogance, and the breaking of one's nafs. This is what is accomplished in the sujood. And Imam Shawkani he stated likewise, Yani, فَإِذَا سَجِدَ فَقَدْ خَالَفَ نَفْسَهِ وَبَعُدَ عَنْهَا فَإِذَا بَعُدَ عَنْهَا قَرُبَ مِنْ رَبِّهِ So whenever an individual prostrates, then he opposes his desires, and he becomes distant from it. And whoever is distant from his desires, then he becomes close to Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala. For this reason, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that we are prostrating properly to Allah. Not on the forehead, but with the forehead and the, and the, and the nose touching the ground, with the face being flat to the ground. Likewise from the mistakes, and this was something I was seeing from some of those praying tarawih. Is an individual laying his forearm on the ground, resembling the, uh, a dog. As the Prophet وسلم, he stated, وَعْتَدِلُوا فِي السُّجُودِ Be straight in your prostration. وَلَا يَبْسُطْ أَحَدَكُمْ إِنْ بِصَاطْ الْكَلْبِ and do not lay your forearms on the ground like that of the dog. As the Prophet said in the previously mentioned hadith, Yani al Yadain, he's been commanded to prostrate on seven, and he said the two hands, not the forearm, with your elbows and forearm touching the ground. But one's elbow should be up in the air, and one's armpit should be seen. This is the proper way of making or prostrating to Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala. And it is only done by those that have concern for their deen. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أشراف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد In the previously mentioned hadith of Ibn Abbas the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he stated أمرت أن أسجد على سبعة أعظم الجبهة وأشار بيده على الأنف واليدين والركبتين وأطراف القدمين ولا نقفت الثياب والشعر. He stated that I have been commanded to prostrate on seven bones, the forehead, and then he pointed with his finger to his nose, the two hands, the two knees, and the tips of the toes. And you, we do not cuff or roll up our garments, nor tie down the hair nor tie down the hair. This last portion of the, of the hadith is a mistake that is seen commonly 
you find people coming to the masjid and they start to roll up their garments above or their, their pants legs above their ankles. As they're rolling or tucking up or cuffing up any portion of the garments is considered prohibited in the salah. As Imam al Nawawi, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he said, Ittafaqa al ulama al nahi an al salah wa thaw mushammar aw kummahu aw nahu dhalik. That the scholars have agreement on the prohibition concerning a salah while one's garments is rolled or cuffed up. Yani his garments, his stove, or his sleeves, or whatever resembles that. That there should be no portion of one's garments, regardless if it be the sleeves or his pants, rolled up while he is praying. And if the individual does so while he is praying, then he is sinning in the salah. He is sinning in the salah. But this is seen quite often that an individual comes into the masjid, and right before he prays, he rolls his pants legs up above his ankles. And the only reason why I believe that an individual does that is that they understand that it is prohibited for an individual to trail his garments below the ankles. And for whatever reason, they see the importance of, of it being, the, the garments being above the ankles in the salah, but don't see the importance of it being rolled up outside of the salah. And as a result, they're sinning outside of the salah and sinning in the salah. As some individuals, they base of their position that keeping the garments above the ankle is makru based off some of the statements of the A'immah to Salaf. As some of the Imams of the Salaf held the position that, that keeping one's garments up above the ankles was only, or excuse me, lowering or trailing the garments below the ankles was makru or disliked. But this is deemed to be a mistake by these A'immah. And the Ibra or the lesson is not in their statements, but is in the proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. As it is not only something that is considered prohibited, but it is considered a major sin. As we know the kada'ir, by certain signs, any action that Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala, or His Messenger has dubbed to be kufr or shirk, but it does not reach the level of that which exits one from the millah, then it's considered from the kaba'ir. Any action that has connected to it a, a legal Islamic punishment in this life, then it is considered from the kaba'ir. Any action that has a threat connected to it in the next life, regardless if it is a threat of the fire, or a threat of being distanced from Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala's mercy, or a threat of Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala not loving an individual, or a threat of Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala not speaking to an individual, or a threat of Allah to Baraka wa Ta'ala not looking at an individual, and thus forth and so on, then it is from the major sins. And when we look into the ahadith as it relates to the subject matter, then this particular action has several there are several signs indicate, indicating that it's from the major sins. As we have an authentic narration, that is upon the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, or Ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhi, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, Uzratul Muslim ila nisf al-saq, wa la haraj fi ma baynahu wa bayn al-ka'bayn, wa ma kana asfala min al-ka'bayn, fa huwa fi nar wa man jarra, the Prophet ﷺ, he stated, the garment of the Muslim, it hangs to half his shin. And there is no harm in that which is between it and the ankles. And whatever drags below the ankles, it is in the fire. It is in the fire. 
And whoever drags his garments out of arrogance, then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will not look to him. Yani on Yom al as other narrations mention. And it is this portion of the narration where you find some of the ignorant attempting to imitate scholars. Oh no, what is intended is this. Being in khilaf of principles found in usul al-fit. Being in khilaf of the principles connected to al-mutlaq, yani wal-muqayyid. And trying to restrict yani, these punishments to uh, one particular reason. And that is an individual trailing his garments out of arrogance. And then saying, I'm not like Abu Bakr, I don't trail my garments out of arrogance. As it came in a hadith of, uh, of, uh, of Ibn Umar, where the Prophet وسلم, he stated, Man jarra thawbahu khuyala lam yandur Allah ilayhi yawm al-qiyamah. Faqala Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Ya Rasulullah, inna ahada shiqqayi izari yastarakhi. إلا أن تأحد ذلك منه فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم لست ممن يصنعه خيلا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said whoever drags his garments يعني below the ankles out of arrogance then Allah تبارك وتعالى will not look to him on يوم القيامة. So Abu Bakr he said O Messenger of Allah a side of my garment falls or drags. Unless I am very attentive and cautious as it relates to it. The Prophet ﷺ then stated, Oh Abu Bakr, you are not from amongst those that do that arrogantly. There are some things that have to be looked at and understood by the statement of the Prophet ﷺ to Abu Bakr. First off, Abu Bakr was not exiting the home with garments that were tailored to fit below his ankles. But he had garments that were above his ankles and due to his thinness and individuals can return back to the description of Abu Bakr due to his thinness that his, sometimes his garments would drag, uh, slide down or drag due to his thinness and when he would see it he would attempt to raise it above his ankles. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ stated, You are not from amongst those that are doing that arrogantly. Why? Because you are attempting to keep them up above the ankles. That's the first thing. The second thing is that in the Hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, there are two reasons in which the Prophet ﷺ connected, connected threats. One was lowering the garments out of arrogance and the direct yeah, any threat that was connected to that was that Allah would not look at an individual in Yom Qiyamah. Then there was another action, merely dragging the garments below the ankle, and the threat that was connected to that is that it is in the fire. Two different reasons, two different rulings. So it is not correct for one to try to apply this one, rule, one reason in a general sense. If you drag the garments out of arrogance, then Allah will not look to you. If you just merely drag the garments below the ankles, then it is in the fire. But then we have the hadith of Jabir ibn Sulaim to further yani, emphasize this point. When he said to the Prophet had ilayya, give me some advice. The Prophet وسلم, he said, لا تصبن أحدا Do not insult anyone. And Jabir ibn Sulaim, he, sta he stated after hearing this that he never insulted anyone, not a man nor a woman, nor someone who was freed or owned. And then the Prophet وسلم, he stated, لا تحقرن شيء من المعروف ولو, يعني ولو uh, تكلم أخاك وأنت منبسط إليه وجهك إنما ذلك من المعروف and do not look at any good action as insignificant even if you were to meet your brother with a cheerful face and you're speaking to him with a cheerful face for indeed that is from good and then after that the Prophet وسلم, mentioned ورفع إزارك إلى النصف الساق and lift your garments to half the shin. فَإِنْ أَبَيْتَ فَإِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And if you refuse, 
even to the ankles. وَإِيَّاكَ وَإِزْبَالَ الْعِزَارِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنَ الْمَخِيلَةِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمَخِيلَةِ And raise your garments to half the shin. And if you refuse into the ankles, and beware of dragging your garments below the ankles, for indeed it is from arrogance. And Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala does not love arrogance. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala does not love arrogance. And in the hadith of Abi Umama, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi, he stated, Bainama nahnu ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha lahiqana Amr ibn Zurara al-Ansari fi hullatan izaran wa ridaan qad usbila That while we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Amr ibn Zurara al-Ansari, he came wearing garments that were dragging below his ankles. فَجَعَلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَأْخُذُ بِنَاهِيَةِ ثَوْبِهِ So it caused the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to take, yani, to grab a portion of his garments. And he said to him, yani, yani, uh, your servant or uh, son of your servant, your male or female servant, حَتَّى سَمِعَهَا أَمْرِ Until Amr heard this, فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ <clears throat> ya Rasulullah, inni ahmashu as-saqain. Oh Rasulullah, indeed my, shin is, my shins are very thin, very skinny. Amr was ashamed of, of the people seeing his shin. This is the reason why he was dragging his garments below the ankles. It clearly was not being done for arrogance. But the Prophet wasallam he responded, Ya yeah, Amr. إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقًا Indeed, Allah Taala, He perfects or makes good everything He creates. يَا أَمْرَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْبِلِ Oh, Amr, Allah Taala does not love the one that drags his garments below his ankles. So how is it that it could be understood that this is something that is merely maqru? When Allah Taala doesn't love the person that does it, and there's a threat of the fire looming over the individual's neck for the one that does it, outside of arrogance. But if that was not sufficient, then we have the Hadith of Abi Dhar al-Ghifayri, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated, Talaathatun la yukallimuhum Allah yawm al-Qiyamah, wa la yandru ilayhim, وَلَا يُزَكِّيهِمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ There are three individuals that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will not speak to on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Nor will He look to them. Nor will He purify them from their sins. And for them is a severe punishment. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He mentioned, الْمَنَانْ بِمَا أَعْطَى The one that constantly reminds people of what He gives. Constantly remind the people of his generosity. Brother, remember I gave you this. I gave you $20 this day, brother. brother. I gave you this this day, brother. Brother, I gave you this. Remember that. This type of individual Allah Ta'ala hates. He will not speak to. He will not look at. And for this individual is a severe punishment. But then after that, the Prophet ﷺ, he stated, Al-Musbil Izarahu, the one that drags his garments. And he didn't mention out of arrogance. The one that drags his garments. Wal-Munafik Silatahu Bil Halaf al kathib And the one that sells his merchandise by way of false oaths. Yani lying. Swearing, but he's lying when he swears. Wallahi katha. Wallahi, wallahi. These three individuals Allah Ta'ala has a severe punishment for. So again, this particular action is, cannot be considered as makru in light of the evidence. Regardless of what some of the a'imma have stated. It is considered to be a mistake on their part. And they are still rewarded for their ijtihad. Thus it is incumbent upon us, Ya Ibad Allah, to be concerned with these particular issues. As a person that hopes for success in the next life, then he is concerned. 
As for the one that says, yeah, whatever, then this individual does a- a- actions of a loser. As Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala he states, إِنَّ مَا كَانَ قَوْلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمُوا بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِّعْنَا وَآطَعْنَا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ The statement of the believers, when they are called to Allah and His messengers are judged between them, it is that they say, we hear and we obey, and they are those that are successful. They are those that, that are successful, not the individuals that come with analytical rhetoric, but brother this, but brother that, and try to in, consequently argue against Allah and His Messenger based off no knowledge. And with that, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha la anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wa aqimu salat.